in terms of their initial contributions so that we can maximise time for questions. Um, on my far right, as you know, we have um, Stephen Gethins. That isn't a reflection of your political positioning. I'm <laughs> sorry I said such a thing. Um, SMP on their far left. <laughs> well, indeed, there you go. SNP spokesperson for international affairs and Europe at Westminster. Stephen has enjoyed an illustrious career in political and international NGO sectors. Um, he was, until recently, a special advisor to Scotland's first minister, advising on European and international affairs. And he was also a political advisor with the Committee of the Regions in the European Union, a position which saw him working with local authorities across Scotland. And in 2011, as part of a select number of other European participants, Stephen was involved in the US government's international visitor program, which analysed US foreign policy challenges. Uh, Mike Russell, MSP and Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations, is on my soft right, my centre right. Um, <laughs> Michael is the constituency member of the Scottish Parliament for Argyle and Butte, one of the most beautiful parts of the whole of Scotland, if you ask me. Uh, even as an Aberdonian, I would say that. And Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations, a uh, post to which he was appointed by First Minister, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, in June 2018. This followed on from the post he was appointed to in August 2016, which was Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe. Michael has been a, a minister in a number of positions um, throughout Parliament and was elected in 99 to 2003 for the south of Scotland and from, again, 2007 to 2011. On my left, we have Professor Nicola McEwen, Associate Director at the Centre on Constitutional Change. Nicola has been at Edinburgh University since 2001, first as lecturer. In fact, I think you were one of my lecturers back then. Um, <laughs> then <laughs> senior. Did you like that slight thing? Yeah, but, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure Nicola would remember that, uh, but, but I certainly do. Um, and uh, then senior lecturer in 2006, and as Professor of Territorial Politics from 2014. She is co-director of the Centre on Constitutional Change, which was originally set up as a key investment under the ESRC Future of the UK and Scotland programme. Uh, Nicola has published widely in the field of territorial politics, nationalism, multi-level government and policy making, and multi-level parties and elections. And she is actively involved in informing debate within the wider policy and political community through media work, public engagement, <coughs> advisory, and consultancy work. And last but not least, uh, we have Professor Anand Menon, Director of the UK in a Changing Europe. Before coming to King's College London, Anand was Professor of West European Politics and Founding Director of the European Research Institute at the University of Birmingham. Prior to that, he was University Lecturer in European Politics and Fellow at St Anthony's College, Oxford. He has held visiting positions at New York University, Columbia University, and the University Libre de Bruxelles. I like totally missed, absolutely got that pronunciation totally wrong. Um, we can forgive me that, I'm sure. I just forgive myself at the very least. Um, he is an Associate Fellow of Chatham House and Senior Associate Member of Nuffield College, Oxford and co-editor of the journal West European Politics. So, having done that whistle-stop introduction of our panellists, I'm now going to ask Stephen to go first with five minutes and one minute warning, because we're going to keep... No, no, fair enough. enough. Um, and off you go, Stephen. Well, actually, by rights, so I'm going to be totally honest, this should be a remarkably short speech, because if anybody asks you what happens now, nobody knows. <laughs> so you can all go and have your lunch, because uh, there shouldn't be anybody that, that disagrees with me on, on, on the panel. Um, we're, we're in a remarkable um, situation with that. At the last meeting, in a I, I came and I was, I was just doing a meeting with business before I came in, and I was asked as my very last question, how optimistic am I about the future? Which is a fair question to ask. I don't know either, because it's very, very difficult um, to tell. I think, first of all, let's paint a picture. Um, you have to pinch yourself sometimes, and you really do. Even those of us in this room who are extraordinarily critical of the UK government, you have to pinch yourself that you're in a situation for the first time since the Second World War, over the summer recess, the UK government appointed a minister for food security to make sure we've got enough food to eat. Um, you've got medical trials that are being withdrawn, you know, literally a case of life and death. You've got other stockpiling of medicines. 
this is all, if, if you'd said, if you'd accused a government of doing this kind of thing a couple of years ago, or even in the aftermath of the EU referendum, that this is a state you'd get into, you'd, you'd have taken absolute pelters for, 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 the, for the kind of picture that, that, that you were painting. But that's the situation that, 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 that we find ourselves. I'm also one of the, the few individuals who was, um, who, was, who, who was permitted to go and look at the UK government, the UK government's own economic analysis of what Brexit means. Now, the good news is that the Scottish and UK governments might not agree on much, but their economic analysis, I can tell you, was pretty similar. And the reason I know that is because the Scottish government had the decency to publish their economic analysis, whereas the UK government didn't. And that was a GDP hit of up to 10% in, in 2030, of, in Scotland alone, about 80,000 job losses. Now, if you have a big GDP hit and less people in jobs, you need more money for public services, and that means less money for education, less money for your health service, less money to invest back into your economy. It's an extraordinary situation. And, and the reason I paint that picture is it really is quite a messy situation in which to be. Um, where am I hopeful, however? Well, I'm hopeful about this, which is... The June 2017 election did one thing, and that's that it made the UK Parliament um, that little bit more European, um, in the sense that it was a parliament of minorities. Now, this is something that's very, very, very common um, in other European states. It's very common in the devolved administration. I'm sure sometimes to Michael's um, frustration um, that, that, that you don't have a majority but that's the situation in which governments find themselves in the Scottish Government as it did in the 2007 to 2011 and it has to do, do so now I, I wish there were days you thought, wish it was otherwise but you have to go out and you talk to other parliamentarians you talk to other parties and in some European countries actually with that um, bit of compromise once you get to the other side you come out with better legislation because actually if you're in a minority government it needs that bit more scrutiny and I've been astonished by the, the lack of culture change in Westminster that, it, that you have a government still trying to operate as a majority even in this kind of situation so there's an opportunity with the Parliament of Minorities and there's a I believe that there's a majority across the House to look at a customs union single market option, which was the compromise. Let's not forget the compromise that the Scottish Government offered. Scotland voted to remain. You know, I will bow to nobody in terms of being pro-European. I'm somebody who did Erasmus, benefited from freedom of movement, worked in the European institutions. But that's compromise to offer the customs union and single market option, and it hasn't been taken. So we need to work, and I am working, with colleagues from other political parties. Michael, I know he's working very, very hard. I, we get regular updates on colleagues from other devolved administrations as well. It's the right thing to do when you're facing this kind of crisis. And it is a crisis, make no mistake about it. And here's a wee bit of hope that I hope I can put out now. I think that Scotland can act as a bridge to the rest of Europe. One thing that I've done as part of my job is that I'll spend time in London or Edinburgh or even occasionally elsewhere in Europe, briefing parliamentarians and others from other European political parties on the situation in the UK. And I'll try and be as honest as I can. And the level of goodwill and the recognition that Scotland voted to remain out there has surprised me, you know, because I don't think everybody sort of follows politics in, in Scotland on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's clearly been that following. I think there's also, and I don't want to make Michael blush, because I'm sure he'd be too modest to recognise it, um, too modest to say anything. There's also been some recognition of the good work the Scottish Government's done in trying to reach out to others and to try and have that compromise as well. Now, make no mistake, the relationship between the UK as a whole and the rest of Europe is damaged. You know, for those who have an emotional attachment to a European Union, it is further damaged when you get a foreign secretary, a foreign secretary who compares the European Union to the Soviet Union. And the cacophony of criticism from ambassadors who usually keep their... Keep, keep quiet, from other European politicians is hugely damaging. And a commissioner who was born in a gulag. Let that, let, just let that sink in. A Lithuanian commissioner was born in a gulag. And he's a foreign secretary comparing the European Union to the Soviet Union. Damage has been done to the UK and therefore has done to Scotland. And therefore we, I think Scotland can be a bridge given the goodwill that we've had. 
regardless of what happens in the future. Hopefully, it's, but as an independent country, but regardless, we can be that bridge to Europe. And I leave you with that last thought of optimism. Thank you. Great. Moving on to Michael. Yeah, I mean, let me start by agreeing very much with, with Stephen. I think it is impossible to say what is going to happen next. Um, it, it is it's quite entertaining, actually, to see that the commentariat, of which there are a vast number on Brexit, and I suppose I count myself as one of them from time to time, um, really are bemused about what will take place. You may hear some certainties being expressed, but nobody knows what will happen. And this is, uh, and I echo Stephen's view of the extraordinary nature of the times that we are in, uh, you know, four years ago when we had the independence referendum, uh, I think if people had said to us at that stage, well, you don't worry because you ain't seen anything yet. Four years' time, we're going to be struggling with the result of another referendum, uh, which Scotland voted one way and the rest of the UK voted another way. Um, we're being dragged, you're going to be dragged out of Europe against your will. Uh, the government that is doing so is probably, well, not probably, is the most incompetent government that we have seen in these islands in generations. And day to day, we sort of wake up in the morning thinking, what's going to happen next? You said, no, that's a bit far-fetched. I think you know, we're going to settle down for a bit now. And it's just absolute chaos. Um, I think I can probably make some guesses as to a spread of likely uh, events, but I don't think any of them are, are, are certain by any manner of means. I think the other thing to say is, and Stephen reminded us of this, in one sense, nothing has changed. In December 2016, the Scottish Government published Scotland's place in Europe. We then said what we thought the economic damage would be from any of the options that uh, uh, were on the table. Uh, we indicated that whilst we profoundly disagreed with leaving the EU, we would differentiate the politics from the practicalities. And that means that we would offer a compromise, and the compromise was the Norwegian option, essentially. Slightly different, but can be defined in that way. Uh, and that we sought a meaningful discussion of that. And if it was not to apply to the whole of the UK, it certainly should apply to Scotland. And differentiation was possible. We're two years on. That offer is still on the table. More and more people have supported it. Clearly, differentiation is something that's going to take place uh, in terms of what happens in Northern Ireland. Uh, and yet, Scotland's position hasn't changed. And the chaos in the UK government has simply got worse. And you know, in, in, in what can only be seen as a classic error, the divides get bigger the more they try and write down and define what they want to achieve. I mean, the extraordinary thing about the Chequers Agreement was that was the, the fracture moment in, in the Tory cabinet, because for the first time they'd actually had to write down what they wanted to achieve, and they couldn't even agree on that. So the spread of likelihoods and options are exactly essentially as they were two years ago which is that you could either stay, and that would be the most sensible decision to make, uh, given that we now know a great deal more about the campaign and how the campaign was run, how it was illegally run, how there were you know, huge question marks about the financing and operation of that campaign. And we also know it was based on a false premise. You could also take a judgment the last two years and say, even if the idea was the right one two years ago, the sheer incompetence of executing that idea is one that means that it cannot be fulfilled. It just is impossible to do this in any reasonable way. That's not to say there might not have been a reasonable way to leave the EU, but certainly it's not one that the UK government has found. So you could say staying is good. The Norwegian option, EFTA EA option, is not as good and will have financial and other consequences, but at least it's a rational option. And it's you know, always been seen as a way into the EU, so maybe it's the way out. And you take a period of time to reflect upon what is happening and you stay as close as you can. And in Scotland's terms, for example, with freedom of movement, certain aspects of that are essential to our well-being. I am not astonished but constantly struck at the, the rhetoric around migration in the rest of the UK. And I see it you know, as a member of the JMC. I hear it from UK ministers. It is utterly different. We are dependent upon freedom of movement in Scotland. If you look at the highlands of Scotland, too, working population of 260,000 people, 80,000 of those will retire in the next five to 10 years. We are not reproducing ourselves, to put it bluntly. And in those circumstances, we will be 80,000 people down in 10 years' time with no prospect of replacing them through migration. Uh, because clearly there is a quite a strong turnoff factor at the present moment. That simply will lead to further depopulation. My constituency is suffering severe depopulation as it is. That will simply accelerate. So 
staying, but not staying, but having the, the single market customs union option is the next thing. And the only acceptable thing, because the further you go from the present situation, the more damaging it becomes. Then you have this free trade arrangement, the UK becoming unique in history, the only nation that endeavoured to uh, negotiate a worse trading relationship. <laughs> you know, and that's what's happening because they are endeavouring to walk away from one set of trading arrangements into a worse set of arrangements, no matter what you do. But you know, the free trade option will be noticeably worse. I mean, of that there is no question. There are a whole range of things that simply are not available in any known or even extended free trade arrangement. So that's still there. And then you move to the, the no deal, the world trade option. And we don't know what would happen then. I mean, to be blunt, that is the, the worst unknown unknown, because it's impossible to tell how that would work. My own view is that there would have to be arrangements cobbled together on almost a daily basis in a whole range of areas simply to allow us to continue to function. And, you know, my colleague in Wales um, uh, it, it, it makes the same point. The day after, is there a queue of traffic that goes from Holyhead to the Welsh border? Is there a queue from Grangemouth to Edinburgh and beyond? We could not tell you. So my expectation is, in this last minute of what I'm going to say, there will be a cobbled together high-level agreement that gets the UK passed next March, although I think the possibility of the House of Commons refusing that is quite strong. And indeed, the other parliaments of these islands will also debate it. I mean, um, um, Carwin has indicated that Wales will debate it. I'm sure we will debate it. And in Scotland, I'd be surprised if there is any majority for it. There won't be. So there will be a high-level cobbled together agreement, and we will know not much more than we know now, but we will be out. And in those circumstances, any heft we have, any weight we have in negotiation has completely gone. And that means that this time next year, we will be sitting around this table again, trying to discuss what's ahead, because the hard part of negotiation is still ahead. The future arrangement, the easy part was meant to be exit and the high-level agreement. The hard part comes next. And I think in that instability, that political instability, there lies continued decline. So the only alternative to that is to find the right moment at which the people of Scotland can make a judgment as to whether they wish to continue with this nonsense and this madness, or whether they want to be normal again and to be a small nation in Europe. And I shall certainly be campaigning for the latter. I know exactly what's going to happen, and I'm going to tell you precisely. I'm not really. <laughs> but actually, uh, just just to be argumentative, let me just take issue with a couple of things I've heard so far, and then I'm going to answer all these five questions within five minutes. I think Stephen's a little bit unfair in the sense that any government would have to do contingencies for no deal now, because if the government wasn't doing them, they'd be accused of being ridiculous, because the negotiations might break down. Now. I'm not going to sit here and defend how the government's done the Brexit negotiations, but I think contingency planning for the event of no deal makes perfect sense because any international negotiation, you don't know how it's going to end, you don't know if you're going to get parliamentary approval, and if we ended up falling out without a deal, without contingency planning, it would be even worse than it would otherwise be. And in response to what Mike said, we know exactly what no deal means. No deal doesn't mean we will s strike small deals with the European Union to keep the aircraft flying, to keep the drugs going over borders, because the European Union will quite simply turn around and say, you sort out the money, you sort out citizens, you sort out Northern Ireland, and until you do, we are not talking to you. No deal will be a calamity. Let's be absolutely clear about that. If we leave the European Union without a deal, it will be horrible. There will be queues. The flights will not be able to fly. Uh, it is not an outcome anyone on either side of the channel should want. On government incompetence, very, very quickly, maybe the government's incompetent. In many ways, it is incompetent. Whatever government we had, if we had Superman as Prime Minister with a majority of 250, Brexit would be a nightmare to do. It's worth bearing that in mind. Brexit is just hard. It's hard because of how deep our links are with the European Union. It's hard because EU rules give us two years to untangle them all. 
No one could leave the European Union easily. That's the point of the rules for leaving, is to make it look like a nightmare, and we are sure as hell making it look like a nightmare. Now, the five questions. Would there be, will there be a majority in Parliament for this? We don't really know, but we know what the government's strategy is. The government's strategy is to hold the vote as late as possible so that there is very little time to negotiate any, anything different, and to turn to the sort of remainy side of the Conservative Party on the <coughs> one hand and say, if you don't vote for this deal, the option is no deal. Do you really want that? And to turn to the European Research Group on the other side and say, if you don't vote for this deal, there is a real danger you're going to have a second referendum and no Brexit. Do you really want to risk that? And hope that the combination of those two arguments will be enough to sneak this through Parliament with the support of some Labour backbenchers who will also be swayed by the argument that the alternative is no deal. You should also bear in mind that the greatest rallying cause for the current Parliamentary Conservative Party, he was referred to me recently by a Conservative MP as the best chief whip we've ever had, is Jeremy Corbyn. If you ask the soft Remainers in the Conservative Party, what is the one thing you could imagine that's worse than Brexit, their response will be John McDonnell. Okay, uh, and it is worth just bearing in mind the degree to which the prospect of this Labour Party being in power will act as a very, very strong force bringing the Tories into line when we come to this vote. It's going to be very, very close. We don't know how it's going to go, but that's how I see the government playing it. Is there enough time to have an, a, another referendum? Yes, absolutely. There's a very, very good report done by the Constitution Unit recently that said it'll be tight, but there's time. And also bear in mind, if we decide to have another referendum, the EU will extend Article 50 uh, through to the European elections. So there is time to do it. Whether the people want another referendum is a whole different question. We don't know. Depends on the question you ask. If you say in a survey, do you want another referendum, the answer tends to be a Brenda from Bristol. Oh, Jesus, anything but another bloody referendum. If you ask the British people, do you want to be in control of the final Brexit deal, then they'll say, yes, please. So the question matters. Uh, what the result will be, anyone who tells you they know how the, what the result will be is lying. The polls are too close, the polls are too uncertain, and we have absolutely no idea who will actually turn out to vote. That's the biggest uncertainty about a referendum. But finally, what I'd say is be careful what you wish for, because if you really think another referendum will sort the Brexit issue once and for all, imagine a scenario where we have another vote and we vote to remain by 52 to 48 on a turnout that is slightly lower than the one we had in 2016. Do you think the issue goes away? Do you think, actually, we would be the sort of country anyone should want in the European Union in that situation? We would be a total nightmare. We would veto everything. Uh, so whilst the European Union member states have to, out of politeness, say, yes, we'd love you to stay, I suspect in a lot of sort of private conversations they're thinking, oh, Jesus, just imagine this United Kingdom with its current politics remaining in the European Union. It wouldn't be pretty. Should freedom of movement re be reformed or defended? It should absolutely be defended. The economic evidence is pretty damn clear on this, that EU migrants into this country have provided far more to us than we have provided them with in purely economic terms. Should government have been more sensitive to the implications of free movement for certain parts of the country? Absolutely. But if you have parts of the country where you've, you've got problems of excessive population, it strikes me that the choice between building a few extra schools and hospitals and leaving the European Union was a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, but this is years of public policy neglect by governments of both sides. Uh, and I think it's something, it's one of the implications of Brexit we need to think through in the post-Brexit period. We need to put right the things that made people dissatisfied in this way in the first place. Will there be a special Scottish deal? Absolutely not, there won't, I'm afraid. And i tell you why. The reason the Northern Ireland is going to get a special deal is because the Republic of Ireland wants it. A member state wants it. Do not underestimate the fact that loads of member states are very unhappy with the special deal Northern Ireland is getting. The French government thinks it will give the Northern Irish unfair competitive competitive advantages within the single market. They're only doing it because they know they have to support Dublin to make the European Union united. The notion that they will do it for any other country without that backing by a member state strikes me as for the birds. And one of the sad things about Brexit for me is on the day we leave, Scotland votes for independence in some future that Nicola's going to talk about, they will be treated like a third country. And being treated like a third country, however warm the words are, is unpleasant. The EU has very, very strict rules and procedures for that. I'll leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you. And last but not least, we now move on to Nicola.
Okay, thanks very much. Um, I agree with much of what has been said about uh, all of the uncertainties that are ahead. I share some of the reservations about the prospect of a, a second um, referendum on something to do with Brexit. Uh, we don't know what it would be. Um, the research that I have been uh, doing as part of Annan's UK and Changing Europe programme has been focused on looking at the domestic implications of Brexit and in particular the implications for devolution um, and they can be really quite uh, enormous in, in changing and in challenging some of the assumptions uh, that we have um, maintained around uh, devolution in the UK uh, including around the Seoul Convention but lots of things being proposed in the name of the UK internal market um, could uh, directly challenge um, the autonomy of the devolved legislatures. But I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, <laughs> what I did want to talk about was what does this mean for the politics of independence? And just to begin with, not to talk about Brexit or Scotland, but I want to say something about Quebec. Okay? So, as many of you will know, um, there have been two independence referendums in Quebec, one in 1980 and one in 1995. The first was defeated convincingly, the second one came after a very long period of constitutional grievances, legitimate constitutional grievances, um, and was held and came so very close to victory, less than 1% uh, of a difference between the yes side and the no side. Last weekend, the pro-independence Parti Québécois suffered its worst defeat uh, in its history, and the politics of independence is nowhere on the agenda in Quebec politics today. Now, Quebec is not Scotland, and the PQ is not the SNP. But what I take from that is that there isn't an inevitability about the direction of travel here. Um, it's a statement of the obvious to suggest that support for independence can go down as well as up. Um, the other thing uh, that I take from it is that while, as in 2014, you can lose one referendum and still emerge victorious, I don't think the same is true of a second uh, referendum defeat. Therefore, Again, a statement of the obvious, timing is absolutely critical uh, from your perspective. Um, now, I, back to Brexit and back to Scotland. There is a strong case to make to suggest that Brexit strengthens the rationale, the arguments uh, for independence, particularly in the context of a no deal, as the polls at the weekend indicated. It strengthens uh, not just the case, but it strengthens the support for independence. We have seen some shifts in the opinion polls, not staggering shifts, but gradual shifts uh, towards uh, a greater support uh, for independence. But it's not dramatic, I would, I would suggest. There's an awful lot of work for you still to do. But Brexit complicates independence. It adds complexity to the case uh, for independence. The First Minister has said that she will come back to, to the issue about what happens next once the terms of Brexit are known. I think I listened to the radio this morning, talked about possibly October, November, January, whenever uh, we know what happens with this stage of the negotiations. Um, but as Mike uh, pointed out, we won't actually know uh, at that point. We might know about the terms of exit, but we won't know much at all about the future relationship between the UK and the EU. So that suggests that there is still and an awful lot of uncertainty about the context in which any uh, independence debate or any independence referendum uh, within the foreseeable future would take place. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to really get to, get, get to grips with the work that needs to take place to re-examine the case uh, that was made in 2014. The white paper uh, was predicated uh, implicitly <coughs> on both Scotland and the rest of the UK being within the European Union. Um, so things that were envisaged there, and not just the currency union, that's the one that's most debated on, and the Growth Commission have already looked at that. But lots of other things were, were um, suggested there around a common labour market, the common travel area, uh, a common energy market, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of things, that, uh, shared governance arrangements between an independent Scotland and the rest of the UK. Now, some of those may still be unproblematic, but some of them uh, definitely are. Um, and particularly if 
we see the UK leave the EU and along with it leave the customs union and the single market, that does bring back the issue of the border. Um, and the, the border uh, becoming a political issue potentially in a future independence referendum where it simply was not uh, the case in 2014. Um, so I think there probably are answers to some of those. Uh, there are lots of scenarios uh, that, that could be played with, uh, but I think there's, there's some deep thinking uh, that has to go on to, to, to determine what independence might look like uh, under a whole range of different scenarios. And I would hope that you wouldn't go into uh, a referendum saying independence means independence, and then we're no clear about <laughs> what that means. Thank you. So that's half of the hard bit for our panelists. The other half now is answering your questions. I'll take questions in groups. We have a rolling mic. And if you could say who you are uh, before you ask your question, that would be great. Um, so we have one question here to begin with, and I'll take another couple, so get your hands ready to go. Hello, my name is Janice Donaldson. I'm from Great Dead South SNP. I'm quite concerned about something that Nicola said about the Quebec question, that they went from just about winning independence to losing that momentum. And that worries me that we may find ourselves in the same position. Do you think, Nicola, it's because of demographics changing that the will for independence in Quebec has changed? I think we need some guidance on that. Can we take another couple of questions, if there are any at this point? And then we'll take it as an answer. We've got another two here. I would just like to ask My main um, question is about acknowledging the level of frustration in the party that we're not being able to get out and campaign um, for an independent Scotland and Europe. And we need, to, I think there's a real sense that we need to get mobilised on the ground and we need to be making a case. And we're very frustrated that constantly we be told to just wait until we find out, especially when you're saying we're actually not going to find out anything. Um, so that there's, there's that sense of time slipping away. If we actually believe in being an independent European country, could we please get some guidance from the party about beginning to make that campaign live on the streets? Good two questions. Yeah. <laughs> so around Quebec in particular, <coughs> around um, some of the campaigning approach, around second independence, and then whether UK government have been respectful or not. Mike, do you want to kick off on any of those three? Well, a respect agenda certainly didn't last very long from the UK. No, I mean, it's been a very difficult uh, process. You know, on one level, uh, you know, it's perfectly civilised. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in London again on Thursday for a JMC meeting. On another level, these meetings are very frustrating. Um, you know, we don't make the progress we should make. Uh, Nicola said a number of interesting things, and we didn't go there, but we, at some stage we need to go there, about the, the view of, de of devolution from the UK government. And I think uh, we see a pretty dismissive view of devolved administrations and their competencies, what they should be doing. And I think that is uh, likely to continue to be very difficult. And in those circumstances, it's hard to do the creative and constructive things you might want to do because you're just not going to make any progress with it. We've said, for example, we will not pass legislative consent motions until there is a stronger basis to do so in the Scottish Parliament. That means a logjam in legislation. So it, the relationship's pretty bad, and it's not getting any better. Can I just address, though, the issue of frustration? I understand that frustration. I feel that frustration. <coughs> but nobody's stopping anybody doing anything. You know, that's really important. I mean, in, you know, in Argyll and Butte, we, uh, as across the country, I'm sure, last week, we were out uh, you know, on the streets with these issues. Um, it, there's absolutely no bar upon doing anything. 
The why of independence is the important thing, more important than the when of independence at the moment, because the when is not in our gift. You know, we have a, a, a devolved settlement that makes the when very difficult to achieve. Now, there are ways, uh, there will be means to achieve it, I'm absolutely certain of that. But, you know, if, 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 if I'm you know, going about Scotland, I'm campaigning for independence, I'm talking about the need for it, and also the need for it that's not just Brexit, and that's really important. You know, Brexit is an illustration of how the UK does not work. It's a very graphic illustration. It is testing it to destruction, you know, but there are many other strong arguments for independence which have continued you know, before 2014 and will continue long uh, into the day. And we should be out talking about those and talking about what they are. And Nicola is also right about visiting some of the things that need to be revisited. That's why we had the Growth Commission. That's why other work is being done. So don't feel that you have to just look out of your window and say, I wish I could go out and campaign for independence. Go out and campaign for independence. I, I do. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. We all have to do it. Nicola, do you want to? There's a specific question on Quebec, but feel yeah. free to go. Away. I mean, there's lots of speculation just now um, about what explained the result of last week, and I'm not going to pretend to know the answers to that. But I mean, I think there is some sense of fatigue kicking in um, when. So, so it's not that the, the underlying issues have gone away, um, but there's not the same appetite among the parties or the electorate to to keep returning to the same argument. Um, all of the all of the time, so that that sort of um, for or against independence that was the dominant cleavage in Quebec, just as it was, just as it is uh, today here, uh, is not the case anymore. But that's not to say it won't return again in the future. Um, there was a second question, I think, around um, oh, just on the on the timing. So on your 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 points about. Um, nothing will be known. It's not that nothing will be known. So assuming there is a deal of some sort on the terms of exit, it will probably be accompanied by um, some sort of wording on the long-term future. It's just that it won't be very detailed, I mean, I've thought. Um, it certainly won't be binding. Um, and because um, there are lots of uncertainties in, in the, the EU context and there will be a new commission, there will be new negotiators, there's change uh, that takes place regularly among member state governments, so, governments, so things can change there, so it's not certain. Um, <clears throat> but it's reasonably easy to identify different scenarios uh, to work within. So my point is just that I hope the party, and probably this work is going on already, but is looking at these different scenarios and thinking, well, what does it mean for customs arrangements um, across the border? The Growth Commission was talked about, but the Growth Commission was relatively silent on the issue of continued EU membership. Um, so is that still the position? And with what implications uh, for Anglo-Scottish relations? So these are things that I think are really difficult issues uh, to contend with, but they, they need to be addressed now. Um, and, you know. But there's no issue of continued EU membership in terms of the SNP uh, and the Scottish Government. I mean, that no. is absolutely clear. The people of Scotland voted to be in the EU, to, to continue in the EU. The Scottish Government's position is entirely clear. That wasn't a matter for the Growth Commission, that's a matter of policy for the Scottish No, Government. I understand that, but it does raise issues about what happens then with customs mm -hmm. arrangements mm -hmm. north and south of the border. Um, so. These are things that I'm not hearing discussed because they're really difficult issues, but now is the time, I would suggest, to, to do it rather than facing it in the context of a campaign. Before I bring Stephen and Anand in, I was going to go for another round of questions and we can take them together. Do you have... Uh, hands up if you have a question. And if you're willing, it would be great if you could stand up as well as say who you are and where you're from. We'll take this one and bring Stephen in. Hi, uh, Doug Daniel, the policy, uh, political education convener. Um, I was speaking to someone who works for one of the MSPs. Who, um, well, th there's this idea that maybe what Scotland should be looking at is the kind of EFTA route, uh, EEA kind of thing. Um, they were saying that actually the EU might kind of look less kinder than that because it looks like we're not being as strong a position as the current one about the EU is. Um, I wonder if that is going to be problematic, if that does kind of start to be the dominant kind of EU party. Yeah. Great, I think we had a question at the front here as well. Is that right? Just get the mic to you. Um, 
Scotland is a country that has met the acquis communautaire, the rules for being a member of, of, of the EU, all, albeit as, a, you know, as, as, as not a full member state, so you know, the, 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 some changes would have to be made. You know, we're, we're not a country that's going to have to... I, I keep hearing all this nonsense about, oh, it takes you years and years mm. and years and years. You know, Iceland wanted to join the EU, and they've got a particular issue around fisheries that I've got great respect for. It wouldn't take them that long. You know, if Norway wanted to come in, you know, if other Western European countries would like to, to come in, we've got 40 plus years of membership under our belt. For, for me, the most attractive option is the European member state option. And, and actually, we, we, we heard earlier on from, from, from Anand um, about other member states bending over backwards for Ireland. That is because Ireland is a member state exactly. of the European Union with a seat around the council, and Dublin has that heft in Europe. And actually, ironically, Dublin is now in a stronger position, um, you know, than, than, than London is, possibly for the first time in its history in terms of its diplomatic clout. And it's been amazing how the EU27 have got behind them <coughs> on that, in, in, in what's a very difficult set of circumstances for the Irish government. Um, so I, I, I think that that's something, and actually as a, as a, as a pro-European, you know, the compromise and talking about it is something we have to do, and it's right to offer a compromise. But it's a compromise. It's, it's not easy. So I think the European member state option um, continues to be the best one. Um, in terms of the respect agenda, Michael talks about that <coughs> on a daily basis. Um, we live it every week in London. It isn't there. And actually, if anybody thinks that when, when we walked out of the House of Commons, that, that was pure exasperation about what was going on, not being listened to, the fact that we represent a majority of Scottish seats in Scotland, pure exasperation at, at, at what was going on and the fact that we debated the biggest changes to the devolution settlement since the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament with 17 minutes of just one speaker. It's you know, I mean, that's, that's something. So the respect agenda is not, not there. And finally, and, and Janice, I know you'll be going out and chapping doors and speaking to people, and, and, you're le and I have your level of frustration as well. If one good thing's come out of it, I've just gone through a whole summer of trying to do street surgeries, canvassing, as a lot of people in this room will have, will, will have done. But what's the one good thing out of that has been actually trying to get a real feel for people. I'll, I'll say this as my final point. The biggest employer in my constituency is the University of St Andrews, by, by quite some distance. Um, and they were a bit, and it's a shame, the convener of the St Andrews branch couldn't get, couldn't get in and she, you know, it can be a bit, you know, it, it can be difficult, and you'll know that the borders, it can be a wee bit difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but listening to folk and seeing the journey that some people are going on, I've found it really informative for me, actually, and, and stuff that I'm able to feed into to Michael, I'm sure he's been, you know, um, going around our girls informative. So if we take anything from it, I'm finding that part of it actually quite useful um, to make me realise what people are really thinking about as we go through this process at the moment. Just before we bring Alan in, there was a specific question, Michael, around independence referendum before uh, March. What do you think? Yeah, I, well, I think it's highly unlikely, I, I, but I don't think that you should worry too much about that because March is not the absolute cut-off date for anything. You know, if you're out and we're out, we'll still be in a transition period unless there's no deal. If there's no deal, you know, I don't disagree with Alan. I wasn't trying to indicate what I said earlier, that it would be absolutely chaotic and unplanned for and disastrous. But in those circumstances, all bets are off. Mm. Uh, you know, and I, therefore, I just don't think that the, the, the setting the date of the 29th of March is a, the last time you could have an independence referendum is at all accurate. Uh, you know, I think we do need to know more about what the people of Scotland are being asked to decide in a time of great insecurity. One of the really big issues in this, and I'm going to address it tomorrow when I speak at conference, is the feeling of powerlessness that people have. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is happening 
and they can't influence it. And I think that we need to get our heads around the fact that's not true. You know, this is not powerlessness. There are things that we can do and we will do over and are doing over a period of time. <coughs> but we also have to have a, a calm sukh about how we're going to do this because we can't have a second referendum in which we do not win that referendum. That would be the utterly wrong thing to do. And, you know, there are many, many great uh, and memorable Scottish heroic defeats. You know, we are not in that business. You know, we are in the business of a, a heroic victory for Scotland. And therefore, we have to do this intelligently, rationally, <coughs> thoughtfully, step by step, and not set ourselves artificial timescales, which we suddenly think, oh, we've got to do it by that date, because we may not be able to do it by that date. We are in... Devolution is a highly unsatisfactory set of circumstances, particularly a Section 30 order, which is required in order to hold a referendum, which requires the agreement of both houses of parliament. That's a very difficult set situation to be in. But nothing is insuperable. I'm absolutely confident that we will be able to give the people of Scotland a choice at, at, at some future date. But let's not limit ourselves by trying to create barriers in our own minds to that happening, because happening, we're going to do it. Alan, if you please set a question as well. Well, look, I'm, I'm an outsider here, but I want to just give a couple of reflections on the question of reflect, respect and the question of timing. might use the word dismissive, and I think that's probably just about spot on for the way the British government has gone about this task. I suppose an interesting question is the degree to which this dismissiveness is due to a sense of contempt or just a lack of capacity, and I do think it's a lot to do with the latter rather than the former. If, if you're not in Westminster and Whitehall uh, regularly, you just won't get the degree to which the place is going into meltdown and the degree to which Brexit is just imposing enormous strains on the governing system of this country. And I suspect that when the British government decided in its cack-handed way to say when powers come back from Brussels they won't go to the devolves, we're going to land them in London, this was less about a power grab, though that was the effect of it, and more about the fact, oh my God, we can't face another complication at the moment because we've got 2,000 other things going on. And, and that is essentially how, how we're being governed at the moment because things are just so messy. And I understand that doesn't make it any better for you people here. Uh, but I'm not sure we should always assume a malign intent. This is just, this is just stretching the capacity. I'm not there, Adam. Here we go. I'm not sure I always right. assume a malign intent. When I'm not sure this audience is with you. Right. <laughs> 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 on uh, on timing. I mean, it is just staggering how much uncertainty there will be next March. I think that's the point. And yes, we'll have a political declaration. It won't be legally binding. It will almost certainly be very vague. And following that legal declaration, we will have the appointment of a new European Commission by a completely new European Parliament. And it is almost certain that by the time we come to sign a trade deal, we will have a new British government, one way or the other. So the notion that we will know what the future holds strikes me as fanciful. And... However frustrating it may be, the nature of the rest of the UK's relationship with the European Union is absolutely fundamental to the model that Scotland chooses, whether it chooses EFTA or whatever else. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that four or five years down the line we have a British government that's committed to EFTA membership. I, mean, I think it's very, very unlikely, given the state of both major political parties at the moment, but it's not beyond the realms. And I think fighting an independence campaign with that level of uncertainty about the future is, is going to be a bit like fighting it with one hand tied behind your back because that will always be the counter argument we don't know what we don't know where we're going to be how can you do this and you know it's just it's just another complicating factor when there are already so many great should we have a, another round of questions so hands up and again if you are willing to stand up please do and please tell us who you are so at the back and we'll take another Nielsen from Brayburn Branch. Um, with regards to obtaining a Section 30 order, um, has any thought been given to, in the event of a people's vote, that Scotland perhaps put some caveats in, say they would only support a people's vote if one of the trade-offs was getting a Section 30 order? And secondly, if there's an independence, sorry, if there's a general election, Again, could Scotland stand on the basis that if they get a majority of the Scottish MPs at Westminster, then 
that is taken as a Section 30 order. Any other questions before we go to the panel? Ian Douglas here, East Branch, a very personal question. I have a flight booked from <laughs> to Copenhagen Saturday after March. Am I going to be on that plane? <laughs> well, yeah. You will notice on your ticket that there's a wee line at the bottom actually oh. now which actually says that they cannot guarantee that they will be able to deliver that flight to you. So I'm afraid you, you will just have to take your ticket along and hope that they've, uh, they're going to deliver it to you. Um, can I just make one quick point before I answer the, the Section 30 order point, which is important uh, on what Alan has said. Just to be entirely fair on this issue of the respect to gender, there is in an element within the, the relationship now which is just chaos, and that is undoubtedly there. I, um, th there was a meeting of the Ministerial Forum, which is the layer below the JMCEN that's meant to deal with negotiating issues uh, some time ago, just before the White Paper, at which, and I'm not joking about this, we weren't allowed to see, uh, the Welsh Minister and I were, were not allowed to see the places of the White Paper chapters, five of them, but we had them read to us. Oh. Right, and it was like it was like sitting in a in medieval monastery or having dinner or something, and there was this improving text being read to you, and it wasn't really very good text either. And the, the first the first reaction f from the two of us was to say this is insulting, but then I began to realise that the two ministers who were doing this they hadn't seen it either. You know, they, they they had if you'd said to them you know what's in the rest of this they had no idea, and actually repeatedly you discover that nobody knows anything, or the, actually much more commonly, the only person who knows anything is the Prime Minister, yeah. and she's the one at which yeah. it all ends up. Yeah. One of David Davis's favourite catchphrases to me was always, that's a matter for my neighbour. You know? In other words, because his office was in the 11 Downing Street, that's a matter for my neighbour, you know, not for him. And everything ends up there. And if you have a Prime Minister who doesn't tell people things, who is you know, obsessed, and, and very, very obsessed with migration, I mean, extraordinarily yeah. obsessed yeah. with migration, yeah. then you have a real mess, and she's at the heart of the mess. Section 30 order, this is, this is where the heart of this discussion will be you know, over the next few months, and it's, it'll be teased out. Nicola, you may have heard her on the radio this morning talking about that. There was a, some outrage expressed by um, uh, one of the unionist organisations yesterday at something that had been said about democratic choice. Uh, and the issue here is, is just very simple. The Scottish National Party's you know, view of this is there should be a referendum. That's been our policy for a long time. But you know, if, if, the, if the Unionist parties then say you can't have a referendum, which is what the debate has been in the last few weeks, then there has to be discussions about what happens next. That is simply anti-democratic. I mean, to the extent, you know, the Vince Cable take on this was the most entertaining one. Um, and I know the words Vince Cable and entertaining are not often in the same <laughs> sentence. But, you know, his position at the start of the Liberal Conference was, you must take part in the people's vote. Not that the SNP, you know, should consider it. You must take part in the people's vote. You're betraying Scotland by not doing it. But equally, we will put in place lots of arrangements to stop you having an independence referendum. Yeah. That is not a way to win friends and influence people. You know, you are bound to resent that. So there, w there has to be a healthy discussion about the ways in which, not that there's any sleight of hand or anything like it, but the democratic way in which Scotland could say it wished to make a choice. And that's a legitimate discussion to have. The SNP's position is entirely clear. We think that should be by means of a referendum. Nicola, there was Article 50, Section 50, Article uh, section 30, all of these different terminology, can you pick up on what they are and where <coughs> we are on them? Yeah, well, under the devolution settlement as it stands, the constitution is a reserved matter, uh, including referendums on constitutional futures, and, and therefore, as happened last time, if uh, the Scottish Parliament wanted to have a referendum or legislate for a referendum 
on similar terms to uh, the last one, then it would require um, a transfer of the powers uh, in, in, to enable that to happen. Um, I think last time, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I don't think there was a concession to suggest that there couldn't be um, a referendum um, without a Section 30 order, but it couldn't be on those terms. It couldn't be as clear uh, as, as the wording. But it's, it's clear. Very I mean, unclear what, what it's, the it's very unclear. It's very unclear. But, I mean, certainly, and First Minister has indicated, I think, that, that um, she would want to proceed with the agreement uh, to transfer the competence mm -hmm. so that you, you could have a question which is similarly unambiguous um, as, as, as last time around. Now, the Prime Minister has said, no, Richard Leonard has said no, um, and <laughs> um, my student said that last week. Um, but we have a, a situation where um, there, there may well be a blockage, and clearly this is all uh, playing politics. Um, now, the Scottish government doesn't want to get into the situation that the Catalan government find themselves in. But the UK government doesn't want to get into the situation that the Spanish government find yeah. themselves in yeah. either. Sure. Um, so I think that, that Kevin Pringle, I noticed, made a suggestion at the weekend <coughs> to uh, uh, be patient and to, to include uh, the commitment in the next Scottish Parliament manifesto. That seems to me to be a, a sensible one, although I hear um, Mike's point about not putting artificial uh, barriers to things. Um, the alternative that has been suggested around having a general election uh, as a sufficient mandate, I think, doesn't get you the Section 30 order. It doesn't get you the negotiated transfer of power, and it may not get the legitimacy of the outcome. And for any referendum, um, it's difficult to envisage an independence referendum clearing a, a yes vote with a very large margin. It's almost certainly going to be the case that if there is a yes victory, it won't be dramatic, it won't be enormous, and therefore you have to ensure a process that is perceived by everybody to be legitimate in order to secure losers' consent. And I think that's really important to the outcome going forward and to any uh, prospect for negotiating independence thereafter. Anand, then there was a question about Corbyn and general election. And general election. Yeah, can I just say on the, on the gentleman's flight, I mean, what I would say about flights is if flights are going to be cancelled, we'll know well in advance because the talks have got to be finished by the middle of January. If there's a deal in the middle of January, then you're fine. If there isn't, then you've got three months to batten down the hatches before we leave with no deal. The Labour Party's policy, insofar as there is a Labour Party policy, uh, seems to be at the moment that we will vote down the Prime Minister's deal because Labour's six tests are unpassable by anything but membership, OK? And once we voted down the Prime Minister's deal, we will then somehow secure a general election. What I should say is, we have this piece of legislation called the Fixed Term Parliament Act, and it makes it very, very difficult to get from a defeat of the deal with the EU to a general election. Uh, it is perfectly conceivable that those Conservative MPs who vote against a deal then also vote against a, vote of no, a motion of no confidence in Parliament, keeping the Prime Minister in place but voting down to deal with the European Union. I cannot see any circumstances at the moment in which Conservative MPs will troop through the lobbies in favour of a general election now. Uh, so there are all sorts of unknowns about what happens in the parliamentary process, but it could just be a sort of long, slow, agonised process of trying to find a new leader of the Conservative Party, trying to find a government, everything, in other words, short of a general election, because there are only very specific circumstances in which you can have that election. And that's... You know, one of the calculations that government whips are trying to bring to bear on their own MPs, and indeed on Labour MPs, because we're in a bizarre situation where some sitting Labour MPs don't want their leader to be Prime Minister either, uh, <laughs> they will be trying to bring this to bear on MPs to say, do you really want that level of uncertainty at such a period in our history? Surely it's easier just to vote for this, get Brexit out of the way, then continue. And I suspect that's going to be quite a powerful argument when we get to November and December. So we've got the last word to Stephen, but I'm afraid it's a short word. Well, so it'll be, it'll be a short seconds. one, which I'm going to have um, great respect for, for Anand. I'll disagree with him very slightly on, on, on this, which is be aware of a general election. If a prime minister wants to go to the country, she will go. And it's yeah. very difficult to keep a prime minister in power. But that, yeah, with, And so that's why I'd say, because we've got a lot of activists and, and, and those of us in the room campaigning, be aware this is not off the table. Um, in terms of a Corbyn government, 
they are in such a lot of mess. I mean, it's difficult to such a lot of mess. Um, now, those of you who are campaigning against Labour, great news, Richard Leonard drooled out backing an independent referendum. You've got something to tell people around the doors. Um, but they're an extraordinary mess. And I'll leave you with this, and this is basically where we started, I'm afraid, which is don't underestimate the amount of chaos that, that we deal with on a daily basis at Westminster. There are days when I'm so grateful to the Scottish Government, if I'm doing media over the course of the day, when things are changing so rapidly that we're, Michael and I are having to talk to each other on an hourly basis, not because of the changes in the Scottish Government, but because of the dramatic changes at Westminster with chaos unfolding and not knowing, literally not knowing, if there'll be a government in two hours' time. So do not underestimate, and apparently that is as of nothing compared to what we're away to see between now and Christmas. So um, I'm sorry to leave you with that note, but I think it's the most honest sort of um, assessment I can give you of what's going to happen over the next two or three months. We don't know, and anything can happen, so be prepared. So on our, uh, just that leaves me to say, so thank you on behalf of IPPR Scotland and the UK and the Trade Union Unit. Thank you to our panellists.